Good morning. Good to have you with us again today. Always good to be together. As we continue through the book of Revelation, we we're reminded that we just finished in chapter 16 last week. We saw the seven bowl judgments, the culmination of the seals leading into the trumpets, leading into the bowl judgments, the bowl judgments affecting the whole world, worldwide. Last, the last thing yet to happen is the second coming of the Lord as far as the tribulation time. We're about to encounter that, but before we do, the Lord steps back and, and through John explains to us, gives us a big picture of what has happened here in the tribulation, of the context of judgment, uh, the, a specific entity that is being poured out upon. So I want us to see that this morning. We come to chapter 17, and we literally see a description of the world crumble and fall apart. That's what's going to take a place. And so uh, uh, let's look at that this morning. Let's see what God has for us. We encounter basically two entities here in chapter 17. Chapter 17 and chapter 18 are one-fifth of all the content material in the book of Revelation. There's a lot of material here. Uh, we'll walk through it. We'll learn together. And we see, we see uh, really the system of the world come under judgment. The leadership of the world come under judgment. We see the big picture of the tribulation one more time before the Lord returns. The world crumbles here, uh, turned upside down. And so let's see how we uh, John shows us that. There are basically two entities in these two chapters. I'm going to deal with chapter 17 today. Um, and so let's look at these two entities, and then, we'll, and then we'll look at the text as well, and we'll learn from that. First we have here in chapter 17, we have a prostitute, we have a woman, we have Babylon. I believe biblically they're one and the same person, three descriptive terms of the same entity. Um, we're going to learn about this in just a second. What we find here in the book of Revelation regarding Babylon, regarding this woman, this prostitute, she is destined to fall. We see that in chapter 14, verse 8. Another angel, second one followed and says, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. That is, that is um, uh, looking ahead, and yet it's as though it's already happened. It is, it is, now, it is now taking place. And whoever and whatever Babylon is, she is now being judged completely and has come to the place of being described as fallen. Her kingdom has been defeated, destroyed, and now the destruction is about to take place. She is the object of divine wrath, God's wrath. Chapter 16, verse 19, God remembered Babylon the Great to make her drain the cup of the wine of the fury of his wrath. This is going to be worldwide. Uh, it's going to be a system that's going to be brought low. So let's look at Babylon. Let's look at this prostitute. Let's look at this woman. What do we know about her? Let's go back to the beginning and take a, a brief glimpse here. Genesis chapter 10, we encounter an individual. We have the three sons of, of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The son, one of those sons, Ham, his, one of his sons was Cush, and one of his sons was Nimrod. This Nimrod, uh, his name, he was a mighty warrior, the first mighty warrior on the earth. Um, and it says the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. And then he went into Assyria and he built Nineveh. Well, we know the story of the Tower of Babel and the, what Babel, Babel and ultimately Babylon is all about. The, the characteristics, the qualities of those kingdoms. We know what Nineveh ultimately becomes. We see here a man who's, who's into uh, empire building, kingdom building. It's not about the Lord. It's not about God. It's about himself. That becomes, that becomes a characteristic, a quality of Babylon that, that becomes the head of all other kingdoms that are going to follow after it. It's going, to become, it's going to become the mark of all other kingdoms that follow after that. We see that in Genesis chapter 11. Babylon represents a systemic rejection, contempt for God. The whole earth had one language had the same words. In fact, God says, multiply and fill the earth, spread out upon the whole earth. Well, the peoples of the world after uh, said, come after the flood, come let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And this is the first time we see in Scripture, recorded Scripture, a systemic worldwide opposition, organized opposition, political opposition, community opposition to the will of God who told 
the inhabitants of the world to spread out and to, and to fill the earth. They said, no, we're not going to do that. If we do that, we won't be able to grow mighty. We won't be able to grow powerful. We can't make a name for ourselves. We want to make a name for ourselves. We want to be known on the earth. That's what they do. Their very existence turns from being about God to being about them and making a name for themselves. They, they thumb their nose at the will of God, have contempt for the way of God. That becomes the mark of this system that now goes throughout human history. We are under that system now, no matter what country we, we live in, no matter what generation we live in. We are under a worldwide system that is in contempt of the will of God. She is exceedingly powerful, Babylon is, which, who, who and what she represents. We see Babylon as a nation under, under King Nebuchadnezzar here. God gives uh, to King Nebuchadnezzar a dream of a statue that represents the, these nations that will unfold biblically in prophecy. The very top of that statue is this, is this golden head. It is the most powerful of all the kingdoms. Every other kingdom is inferior to that kingdom. It is prophetic. Um, and, and Babylon is the one. Uh, her power, her characteristic will infuse and go through all these other kingdoms. Uh, whether it be Greece or, or, or whether it be uh, Rome, whatever it might be, it is, it is this characteristic, it is this quality of contempt and defiance for God that will go through these kingdoms. Um, she is powerful indeed. God of heaven has given this kingdom power and might and glory. You rule, you Nebuchadnezzar, over them all. You are the head of gold. It goes to his head, of course. <clears throat> Babylon as a system, as a country, as an influencer, is a, is a punisher. We see in Jeremiah 25, prophetically, this whole land, Judah, the Syria has already been taken, in, or Israel has already been taken into captivity by Assyria. This whole land, Judah, shall become a ruin and a waste. These nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. And yet she's going to be punished by God. Then after 70 years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation declares the Lord, making the land an everlasting waste. God is going to judge and did judge Babylon. She will never have the power as an empire or city as she did, and yet and yet her stamp will be over every empire that will come. It's kind of like uh, Hollywood. Hollywood has influence over every media element that's made in this world, and yet it's one small town. Babylon was an empire, a powerful empire, who doesn't exist anymore, who is whose whose line is still here on this earth, and yet doesn't have that power, but yet has that influence over everything. That is Babylon. Then we have in this chapter we have the beast. We have the Antichrist. The world yields to the beast. We see that in chapter 13. We saw a beast rising out of the sea, ten horns, seven heads. We see uh, they worship the beast, saying, "Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it?" And all who dwell on the earth will worship the beast. Everyone whose name was not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. The world will yield to the beast. The beast will represent and fulfill and be the, the, uh, um, the fulfillment of all that Babylon, the system of contempt for God, has ever hoped would take place. It is being fulfilled ultimately in the Antichrist. The world will yield. We see that here in, in Revelation 13.4. So let's come to Revelation 17. Let's look at the text. Let's see that together. Let's walk through that together. Get your Bible. Take your Bible. And uh, let's walk through this together. I want, us to, I want to read. I want to, I want to interact with this. Then we're going to come back and take one more important look at what, at what ta is taking place. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters. Here we have the prostitute. She's a woman we're going to see. She is Babylon we're going to see. She's on many waters, which represents many nations, all the nations. She is powerful, exceedingly so. Uh, God says, I'm going to judge her. That's what's taking place, Babylon. The system, she represents, she represents the world system of existence, the world contempt for God, which we live in right now. In every generation, there has been a worldwide contempt for God. With who, verse 2, the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality. And with the wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers on earth have become drunk. Sexual immorality has become, is, is the, is the uh, ultimate cornerstone of defiance and contempt for God. We live in a culture whose, 
whose uh, main emphasis is sexual freedom. America is about sexual freedom. You must be true to yourself, be who you are, and express yourself sexually. And the world says, uh, don't put any limits on who you are. And it has given free reign to a culture that says, simply be true to yourself. And is an expression of this, sex, of this immorality, ultimately of idolatry, the idolatry of sexual expression, the idolatry of other gods, not the one true God. And the kings of the earth here, as, as John is writing, have become, have become uh, drunk with this passion. This, they're driven by their passions under, under the influence of this great prostitute, this woman, Babylon. Verse 3, And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness. We don't know what that wilderness is. Maybe just the existence of the time, the sin. Maybe a place. And I saw a woman. Here's the woman, a great prostitute, a woman. I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. Now we know that scarlet beast is, is ultimately the Antichrist. Sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names and it had seven heads and seven and ten horns. And so we see the woman sitting on the, the Antichrist. The Antichrist is supporting her. The Antichrist ultimately is going to use her to his own purpose. She is, in a sense, in control and yet not in control. Um, he will usurp and take her authority from her. And so we see, we see the dynamic here. This is the context of Revelation speaking into this passage. The dynamic of... Uh, this this uh, woman, this prostitute, this Babylon is is a is a world system. It's a religious system. The religion the religion is we're going to talk about that uh, in a moment. It, it is it is the whole world is a worldview. Okay, and the Antichrist is beholden to the to the power monger, the power uh, people as he first begins his reign, but he will he will usurp and overthrow them. The Antichrist himself is is a blasphemer, and um, he has seven heads and seven ten horns. We've seen that before. It's going to be explained later. The seven heads, I believe, represent uh, kingdoms. The ten horns are kings that serve. Three of those will be overthrown. And verse 4, And the woman, the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations. And, her, and the impurities of her sexual immorality. And on her forehead was written a, the name, a mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and of the earth's abominations. You see, whatever the world has become, uh, it started when Adam and Eve sinned. But systemically, in every culture, in every community, in every nation, and in every time, it, is, it, has, been, it has been imposed systemically from, from the Tower of Babel, from Babylon, all the way through the history of man. It, she is she is the headwaters. She represents the headwaters. She is a force. She is a power, and God will destroy her. She is she is false religion. She is idolatry in this world. She is pulling uh, man, woman, and child away from uh, an allegiance to Jesus Christ, to God Himself, and to following other gods. This system will be utterly shattered, decimated, and broken. And that's what's going to take place. And verse six, John says, "And I saw, and I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus." And so we see this. We see that the world has always hated Christians. The world has always hated God's people. We see in the Old Testament. We see Israel. We see the nations reject the prophets, kill the prophets, hate the prophets, hate men of God, turn against men of God, even Israel, even Judah, because sin is deep. It runs deep even in Israel, even in Judah, in every nation that has ever existed, every people group, every community that's ever existed. Sin, of course, affects us all. All have sinned. It is this sin nature. It is this sin focus. It is this false religion, false way of living that has been imposed on the world and has been it has been violent and devastating on Christians and Christians here in the tribulation martyrs are being slaughtered in the tribulation simply simply because they will not receive the mark of the beast and they identify and are committed to in their allegiance to Jesus Christ they are a threat to the antichrist simply because they will not yield of course 
And so she is drunk. She is she is drunk with the with the blood of saints. She, when when you're drunk, she is she is she is um, she's out of control with the exhilarating feeling of seeing Christians being slaughtered over and over and over again. Remember, she's a personification of a system, of an influence, of of idolatry in this world which at its heart is sexual immorality and all of its expressions of sin. And we continue on in verse 6. And, and so John says, When I saw her, I, 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 I marveled greatly. I, I, was, I was astonished. Probably a better word. And I, I was absolutely astonished. At, at, her, at her riches, she is, she is, in verse 4, she is adorned in absolute wealth. You know, religion at its core is about man. Religion at its core is about is about promoting oneself. Religion at its core, even organized religion, is about attaining and and, it, and receiving wealth and power and influence. And 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 the false church has has here by the time uh, Revelation comes is an exceedingly powerful and wealthy entity that controls everything in the world. And when the church is taken out of this world in the rapture, this system will have full reign. And will demand the power and the allegiance and the money and the wealth of the world. It will be exceedingly rich and powerful in every way. And John is astonished. And then, and then, and, and then, the system is simply um, um, its one goal is the adherence of worship of the world. But its one goal is the slaughter of Christians. And she is drunk with success that God has given her at that. We see that here. Let's continue on. And so we continue in chapter 17 and verse 7. The angel says to John, why, why, why do you marvel? Why are you, why are you astonished? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast with the seven heads and the ten horns that carries her. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. So now we're looking back. We have, we have a description of the Antichrist. He was. He, 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 he seemingly is killed and loses his life. We've seen that here in Revelation already, chapter 13. He rises from the dead, as it were. But ultimately, his, his end is the bottomless pit. It's destruction. But he's still yet to come to power. So this takes us back to the, to the mid, middle of the tribulation. This, this uh, content in chapter 17 is taking us back to the middle of the tribulation. The Antichrist is killed. He rises again, as it were. He, he, he has power. Verse, um, verse 8, And the dwellers of the earth, whose names had not been written in the book of life, from the foundation of the world, will marvel to see the beast, because it was, and is not, and is to come. They will marvel that he seemingly is able to rise from the dead. And this calls for a mind with wisdom. How do we how do we put our minds around this? this? Is the wisdom of God? John's going to tell us here. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. They are also seven kings. Okay, and so this phrase right here has often, often, often been identified specifically with Rome. Rome is the city of seven mountains, the, Rome, uh, the city of seven hills. It has been known as that. It is known as that. There's very much a picture here, a, a, a Roman-esque picture that's described here. Uh, the, question, the question is, is this whole passage talking about Rome? Is it talking about Babylon? Well, who is it talking about? Well, remember, I believe Babylon clearly is mentioned here. Babylon is the fountain from which all other uh, empires Throughout the history of mankind are influenced. The statue in, in Daniel chapter 2, uh, the, the kingdoms in Daniel 7, are all influenced by, by the initial sinful systemic contempt of God from Babylon. And it comes down through all of these kingdoms. Rome is the, is the final gyration, the final iteration of, these, of this, these kingdoms that rise. In John's time, Rome is in complete power. As John is writing, Rome is the empire that controls the world. Rome will fall in John's time, after John's time. It will be revived as the, as the revived Roman Empire here in the tribulation. The Antichrist will take power, remember. He will then be killed when he rises, as he apparently rises from the dead. 
then they will, he will he will take reign of a as it were a new kingdom, and we're going to see the result of that here in the chapter. I believe Rome could be in view here in this verse, but it is ultimately uh, a fulfillment and description of Babylon herself. Okay. So let's continue on. Seven kings, verse ten, five of whom have fallen. So uh, probably biblically we have Greece, we have uh, Egypt, and we have. Um, uh, Babylon, and we have uh, the Medes and the Persians, and we have Greece, and we have Rome, okay? Five have fallen, and one is, and the other has not yet come. And when he does come, he must remain only a little while. Rome is, it will fall, the revived Rome, Roman Empire is, it will fall, and then it will become another kingdom we're going to see here. I believe, I believe some would say that what's being described in this text is Roman Caesars. That's too local of a, of a, of a context. This is a worldwide context here. I believe it is the biblical kingdoms that we see in Scripture. Uh, there's some debate over those, not, not the kingdoms we see in Daniel, and in Egypt probably being a part of that. Um, you have these kingdoms, and then you have, they're, they're behind us now. They're not influencers anymore. One of them currently is. It won't be. Antichrist is killed, and then we have that final kingdom. Let's look at that here. Let's continue, because he tells us that. Verse 11, as for the beast that was and is not, it is an eighth, but it belongs to the seventh. Okay? So the seventh, the seventh world entity, world empire, is this revived Roman empire. When the Antichrist is killed, it seems to the world that that empire is, is falling by the wayside. And yet he rises from the dead, as it were, and he becomes now a continuation of the seventh, but he becomes an eighth because now he rises. The Antichrist, as we saw here in Revelation, rises with a new power. He is now possessed directly by Satan himself. He has abilities directly by Satan himself in the second half of the tribulation. He's going to take control of this world. It'll be a seventh empire in the first half of the tribulation. He is killed. He will rise from the dead. He seems to be killed. He will seemingly rise from the dead. And then he will initiate a, an, an eighth kingdom, as it were, with him in total control. That's what we're going to see. That's what chapter 17, chapter 18 are all about here in Revelation. So the Antichrist is acqu acquiring power. That's what he's doing. Okay? And, uh, and then verse 11, and then it goes to destruction. So destruction is, is, is assured for the Antichrist and for ultimately the kingdom of Babylon, the revived Roman Empire, all these things that we see here in Revelation. Verse 12, And the ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received royal power, as he's writing these things. John's writing, they haven't received power yet, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour. That's, that's that seven years. That's that final time of the tribulation. Those ten kings and then three will be defeated. It'll be seven ultimately. Okay. Um, just kind of condensing uh, material that we know from Revelation, from the scriptures here, together with the beast. Verse 13, and these, these kings are of one mind. They, they help enable and facilitate the rise of the Antichrist. They hand over their power and authority to the beast, the Antichrist, in the first half of the tribulation. They will make, they, all of them, they as a kingdom will make war on the lamb and the lamb will conquer them. I love this. For he is Lord of lords and king of kings and those with him are called and chosen and faithful. We have, we have just a narrative comment right there that Jesus Christ will win. He is in control. Whatever the world will do, whatever the world throws at him, however the world shows contempt for him, he will conquer, he will rule, he will overcome, he will be victorious. Never, ever, ever forget that. And the angel, verse 15, said to me, the waters that you saw, that the waters takes us back to verse 1, the great prostitute who is seated on many nations. The nations, the waters are representative of the nations of the world. The nations that you saw, the waters that you saw where the prostitute is seated are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. There it is. And the ten horns that you saw, they and the beasts, so here's what's going to happen. They're going to rise together in power the first half of the tribulation. 
uh, the prostitute Babylon, the system of this world that has so been so successful through all generations, from the Tower of Babylon all the way through, that has kind of had its sway over every nation, every entity, this worldwide uh, influence of sin, false religion, idolatry, contempt for God, this system that has enabled the Antichrist to come to power, that the Antichrist has used to its advantage to come to power, what do we see here? And the ten horns that you saw, they and the beast will hate the prostitute. See, they will hate that there is, there is another power, another entity who has influence in this world and is keeping them, Antichrist expressly, keeping him from having absolute power. See, when Satan takes control of the Antichrist in the second half of the tribulation, when Satan is thrown out of heaven for the second time, uh, the first time after sin in Genesis, when he's thrown out of heaven and can no longer have any access to heaven, he will throw his, the full weight of his evil against the world and he will indwell the Antichrist. He will not allow any other allegiance. He wants the world to worship him, worship the Antichrist, and as they worship the Antichrist, they are in essence worshiping him. That's what he has always wanted. When Jesus was tempted and, and Satan offered him the world, he wanted Jesus to worship him. He's always wanted the world to worship him. Adam and Eve, when he brought Adam and Eve and, and tempted them to sin, he wanted the world to worship him. He has always wanted what he couldn't have. Worldwide worship. They will hate the prostitute. They will make her, they're going to turn on her, see. The Antichrist is going to turn on the one who helped him succeed in the first half of the tribulation. They will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. They will destroy her. They will take her money. They will take her success. They will, worldwide, the Antichrist will overthrow all religious systems. He will overthrow all religious entities of every nation, of every tribe. There will no longer be multitudes of religions and multitudes of different kinds of worship. He will overthrow them all. He will be, he will be absolute in power. These religions ultimately come from a system that is in contempt of God and wants control. He will overthrow that system and say, I want the devotion of the world to me and me only, not to all these different religious entities, not to other gods, me. I don't want the wealth of religious uh, the religious world to go to benefit and profit other power brokers and other people and other entities, that wealth is now mine. That power is now mine. And he will turn on the prostitute, on the woman, on the harlot, on Babylon itself, and use her for his power. Verse 17, For God has put it into their hearts to carry out his purpose by being of one mind, handing over their royal power to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. See, God's in charge. And the woman, verse 18, that you saw is the great city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. That city is either uh, Rome and is a symbol of ultimately the qualities, the characteristics, the mindset of Babylon itself and herself. Is there a Babylon city here? We're going to see here. I believe not because prophecy shows us that as Babylon punished Judah, then God laid waste to Babylon, an eternal waste. He said there are other passages we could go to. I believe Babylon as a city, a power broker city that it was in the past will no longer be able to take place. Prophetically, I believe God prevents that because of her sin against Israel. Yet she will be the influencer in all kingdoms still and yet. What's taking place here in the passage? Basically, the world is falling apart. You have three and a half years moving into the tribulation. You have a religious entity that demands your money, your allegiance, your power. The Antichrist stands up and says, that allegiance, that power is not going to you guys anymore. It will come to me, to me alone. And he overthrows every religious entity in this world. Which means that's warfare. That's, that's you think of Catholicism and, and Islam and, and Hinduism and 
all the nations of the world. The only way that the, that the religious entities of this world will yield to an antichrist like this is to be utterly defeated. And we see the reality of warfare and battles in Revelation. And ultimately, we have Gog and Magog from Ezekiel 37 and 38, which we've not really spent time on. And I believe somewhere in that process, the religious entities of this world, Islam and others, are utterly and totally defeated. And the Antichrist is able to acquire power across the whole world. Everything changes. The world crumbles. What, what was the key to how I functioned as a human being every day in my religious, in my religious worldview? Crumbles. It falls apart. You know, our world's changing all the time, constantly. It's hard to keep up. What was, what was uh, assured in your life is no longer assured now. Worldviews in America are changing drastically. What was tried and true, what was, what was foundational is changing. Let's look at that. What we see here in Revelation 17 ultimately is that man's world is crumbling. We're, the safety net, this, well, you know, what, what drives us, what motivates uh, a human being, all of us are, are, are created to want more. All of us are created to wonder about our destiny. All of us are created to um, wonder what is our purpose? What is my purpose? How do I fulfill my purpose? How do I make the big, my biggest mark on this world? How do I make a difference? What is, what, why am I here for this time on earth? And so religion is very much a part of the experience of mankind, driving us towards the answers to those questions, when ultimately the answer is in Christ, when ultimately the answer is in, is in the one God alone, our Heavenly Father. And yet religion, the religion is, is, our world is immersed in different kinds of religion. I'm not talking about denomination, I'm talking about the Word of God, the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Apart from that, every other expression of religion is man's effort to try to earn their way to heaven, to be right with God, to fulfill the yearning within their own heart, but doing it apart from God. All this is going to crumble. This religious safety net is going to, is going to be destroyed. It will be, sa it will be the Antichrist who will say, now it's me. You set aside all those other things. You yield to me. You will not, ex you will not express to those gods anymore. You will not hold to that worldview anymore. Let's look at this. How does this take place? What happens when our safety net crumbles? Uh, this false religion, what is it all about? What is, what is idolatry and false religion? What impact does it have in our life? Um, uh, what's taking place? We see ultimately the spirit of the Antichrist alive today. We see contempt for God today. Man is, man is striving to be right with God, but apart from God. That rug's going to be slipped, taken out from underneath us. And the Antichrist is all they're going to have left. Yield to him or die. And it's going to shake up the world. See, when it comes to, when it comes to having a, pursuing an inner peace without God, things are constantly changing in our life. What we pursue is constantly changing. Every culture is constantly changing. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy re, re, uh, refers to that reality. They, this is talking about, about um, they sacrificed to demons. That were no gods. They weren't powerful before, or now powerful. To gods they had never known. To new gods that had come recently, whom your fathers had never dreaded and never heard about. You know, who, what, is, what is an emphasis in one culture was not an emphasis in another culture. What is important to one culture was not important to another culture. As, as nations conquer nations, then those gods who were conquered fall off by the wayside. It is a new God. It is a new entity. It's a new worldview. It's a new expression. What is important changes. Those things are always changing, always taking place. And those things ultimately will be destroyed. The Antichrist will rise to the surface, and then he will ultimately be destroyed as well. False religion, idolatry in our life, folks, it's, it's, it is a cancer that ultimately is going to be destroyed. Whether it's all these religious entities that will be destroyed or the Antichrist himself, they are both Idolaters. They are both false religion. They both exhibit contempt for God. They both express the heart, the quality, the dynamic, the heartbeat of Babylon. False religion, idolatry, is at its core powerless. Second Timothy, understand this in the last days. That's what this is talking about. There will become times of difficulty. People will be lovers of themselves. Lovers of money. Not loving good but lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And you know what? This is how God views all that. We're going to love, 
We're going to love in our life everything. Religion calls us to. The world, the system of this world calls us to love and be attached to things, to love other things, but not God. Not God. Having an appearance of spirituality, of godliness, but having no power. Denying the very power that's available to us. One of the saddest things is to, is to watch people have, have religion in their life, have church in their life, have Christianity in their life, as it were, but have no power. I see no change. See no spiritual fruit, no fruit of the Spirit, no character of Christ. Um, folks, the difference that Christianity makes is the power of God in your life. That's the key. False religion, idolatry, is irrelevant to God. It's, it's ineffective. Romans 8, those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. And it's death. And it's hostility, God. And it leads us to a place I can't submit to God's law, God's word. I don't want to submit to God's word. I cannot please God. Religion, ultimately, although it's man-driven, is about how can I gain God's favor? How can I gain a God's favor? How can I gain this God's favor but on my terms? How can I do that? That's what religion is all about. That's what idolatry is all about. That's all what our, when man strives to do all that apart from God, it's irrelevant. It's ineffective. It doesn't work. The key is when, I, when I'm listening to the Spirit of God, led by the Spirit of God, living by faith in the Spirit of God, I experience life, I experience peace. How many, how many even Christians in name, don't have the peace of God, do not have life in God? If, if, religion is, if the religion is the quality of my life, I, I never experience the peace of God in my life. I never experience the life of Christ in my life. Idolatry, false religion that's destroyed here ultimately is a rejection of God's wisdom. It's always been that way. We destroy arguments, every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. That's what it's all about. Religion, idolatry is built upon the wisdom of this world. What is the, the world views? I will, that, is, is the, that will sway everything that I do. The wisdom of this world is folly with God. You know, our, our, the wisdom of this world right now, and my generation right now, your generation is changing. What is important to this world is changing. If a generation that is young attains full power, that what they value is not what, what I value, not what many Americans value, it is changing. And someday what they value will, will you know what they value is globalism. What they val value is be true to yourself. What they value is be true to your heart. That is ultimately the, the highest expression of idolatry and false religion. That's the truth. That's the wisdom of this world, but it's going to be destroyed. We see that. The wisdom of this world, the, the religion of this world, the idolatry of this world is self-affirming. They exchange the truth about God for a lie, and they worship and serve the creature rather than the creator. False religion is about me. It's about picking up my bootstraps, making myself, living my dreams, being true to my dreams, making my dreams happen. That's the religion. The religion of mankind today is myself, making the most of myself in this world. It's going to crumble. As Babylon crumbles here in chapter 17, these are the things that are falling apart. These are the things that are found to be quicksand, that are not rock, that are not the sure foundation of God's word. All these things, all these drives, all these motivations have been, or ultimately a contempt for God, which is, which is the mark of this Babylon system, this worldwide system of contempt for God. This worldwide system of God drives us to find meaning in anything else but God. And the foundation of that is going to be taken out from under them in the tribulation. It is replacing God. That's what idolatry is all about. Jeremiah 16, 20. Can man make for himself gods? The question is no. These, such, such. What gods I make, they're not gods. That's what he told us. It's destructive. Folks, this is destructive. The idols of the nation, idols are, are the work of human hands. They have mouths, they don't speak. Eyes, they don't see. Ears, they don't hear. There's no breath in their mouth. And those who make them become like them. I'm not able to speak with confidence of God's heart, God's truth. I'm not, able, I'm, not able to see, I'm not able to see what God sees. False religion, idolatry. I can't know God's heart. I can't see his heart. I can't see him in a relationship. I can't hear what he's saying to me. I can't hear what, what he would communicate to me because sin is standing in the way. And so I become like that. I become dead. I am dead. I'm dead in my trespasses and sins. It's, it's destructive, false religion, existence apart from God. That's destroyed here, existence apart from God. 
All the Antichrist does is destroy all the religions of the world, makes one religion in the world, that's globalism. They will all worship him, no one else, or they will lose their life. But he still is the pinnacle. He is the pinnacle of everything Babylon has ever hoped to be. Now everyone is worshiping Satan outright through the Antichrist. He is an absolute power, but he is still an idolater. He is still a false god, a false Christ, and he will be utterly defeated. It is false religion, idolatry is generationally destructive every time. And this is talking about human sacrifice. We're not, we don't do human sacrifice today, or do we? They sacrificed their sons and daughters to the demons. They poured out their innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan. The land was polluted with blood. We don't, we don't sacrifice our sons and daughters, but you know what? We do. We don't do it literally. We don't do it physically. We don't place a child on an altar and take their life. We don't do that. We don't do that, but we lead our kids. We direct our kids down a path that is for self. We sacrifice them to accomplish our means, our ends, our goals. We make them be what they were not created to be. We, we, we prod and push and force them to pursue a life apart from God. We sacrifice everything that is important, relationship with God, so that they can have what they want, which in the end is meaningless, unfulfilling, futile, and empty. We push our kids to be in this and to be in that and to be true to themselves and true to their heart and fulfill the dreams that we have but weren't able to meet and we push our kids hard to do all these things. We don't show them the Lord. We don't show them Jesus Christ. We don't show them what truly is meaningful. And everything that they run for is false. It is idolatry. It is serving self. It is self-centered at the end of the day. Isaiah, woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and shrewd in their own sight. It's about me, my opinion, what I think. Proverbs 21. Every way of a man is right in his own eyes. We push, we push our children to follow their heart. What, is, what do you think you should be doing? What is important to you? And the question is, what is important to God? What does God want you to be? What has he created you to be? What is his desire for your life? I tell you what, if you're answering those questions, and those questions are important to you, the trajectory in the life of your children will be vastly different. Lord willing, they will find the one true God. They will learn to love Him, to be in relationship with Him, and, and know the full promise and blessing of that. <clears throat> False religion is outward. It's not inward. People honor me with their lips. Their hearts are far from me. See, this foundation is taken out. Uh, False religion makes us feel good. doesn't answer the questions. It doesn't bring us any closer to God. False religion, idolatry is in the eye of the beholder. Let no one disqualify you. Some say the best way to live life is just to be simple. Be simple, 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 asceticism. Just live away from the world. Be a survivalist. Be a prepper. Be this. Be that. Eat, be a vegetarian. Do all these things. Just live simple life. Others know it's about angelic. It's about the spiritual things. It's about, it's about the, the, the things we can't explain out there. It's about visions, dreams. Oh, it's about all those things. Oh, it's about what I think, how I view life, being puffed up. It's about all those things. But here's what God says. These things are destroyed. When the system is destroyed, this is the first step of ultimately all that we ever hold on to as sinners being destroyed. We are told in Exodus 20, we are to have no other gods. We're not to make an image of any other God and then worship it. It's about God and God alone. The Ten Commandments, the first two are, are directed at, at God himself. God's desire is that mankind follow after him. Idolatry, false religion, is contempt for the will of God right here. God says, you and I, we're to love him fully. We're to love God with all our heart. And it's to come out of our life so that we love people biblically. And we're to pass this love on to God. To our children. Teach them to your children. Teach the Word of God. Teach the commandments. Teach them how to love God. Pass this on to your children. Talk of this thing. Talk of all these things when you sit in your house, when you're walking by the way, casually, you're in the car, when you're lying down, when you're rising, when you're just living life. Talk about how you love God. Talk about what it means in your life. Influence your children towards the Lord, not towards their dreams, not towards their heart, not towards their ideals. Influence them towards the Lord. 
And the question is, does this describe your heart today? We see a description of the world fall apart here in Babylon 7, in Revelation 17. It doesn't have to. This can be your experience. This can be your reality right here in Psalm chapter 18. I love you, Lord. I love you, O Lord. You're my strength. The Lord is my rock. He is my fortress. He is my deliverer. My God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield, the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. It cannot be undercut. You know, if I'm a martyr for Jesus Christ, it cannot be undercut. Revelation 17 is about, is about the carpet being taken out from, from a sinful world. Religion is destroyed. There is one religion left. It is the Antichrist. It is still false. It is still idolatry. It will crumble as well. The world is crumbling. Chapter 17 is about a religious emphasis being destroyed in this world. Babylon as a religious system will be destroyed. It will be replaced not by, by many religions, by one. It will be the Antichrist. All the peoples of the world who were so religious and so devoted to their gods will either be destroyed or will yield to one religion. That's the Antichrist. And still it will be a false religion and it will still be idolatry. It will still be contempt for God. It will be destroyed. We need to put our faith, our trust. Jesus Christ needs to be our, our strength, our rock, our hope. It is Him that we need to love more than anyone else. I trust that you have that foundation in your life, that you're driving your children to that love, not the love of things in this world, not the love of things they can, they can get by being true to themselves and true to their heart. You encourage them to be true to God, true to His heart, to be what God's created them to be. And they will know a peace and a life that rises above these things that will ultimately be destroyed. Listen to that challenge. Accept it. Parent that way. Grandparent that way. Love the Lord. Pass that on. Thank you for joining with us. We'll see you next week.